The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the webinar, uh, the re-recording of the webinar, Why Is My Salad Making Me Sick? Uh, this webinar is presented by Linda Nato, that's me, and I actually worked uh, as a nurse, including uh, doing a lot of education in nursing homes, especially on things like care practices and infection control measures. And prior to nursing, I was actually a researcher in molecular microbiology at University of Delaware and the DuPont Company. And there I worked with different types of bacteria for about 17 years. So microbiology has been part of my adult life. I also taught microbiology at different levels and I presented uh, at both the local and national level. Currently, I am a care coordinator for Friends Life Care. So um, you may get to meet me at um, one of the Friends Life Care events. So let's get into the webinar. So why is that salad possibly making you sick? Well, here, here are the critters that'll be doing it for you, these guys. So what we're gonna talk about today is foodborne illnesses. Now, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, estimates that each year about 48 million people in the US get a foodborne illness. Of that, about 128,000 end up in the hospital and about 3,000 die. Now, those that are hospitalized and those that die, there's usually other complications. So it's rarely that it's just that foodborne illness. So we are gonna talk about these critters that cause the illnesses, and we're gonna start with a little basic microbiology. And then we're also gonna talk prevention because of course we, we wanna make sure that we don't get these kinds of illnesses. And that will include some safe food handling um, data and uh, some science behind it. So let's start with the microbiology, microbiology 101. And you know, people who know me know that I'm a bit of a science nerd. I've been in science all my life. Uh, and so, uh, excuse me if I get a little excited about this. So what are microbes anyway? Microbes are, uh, the word is short for microscopic organisms. These are living things that are so small you can't see them with the naked eye. You have to use a microscope and sometimes you have to use very powerful electron microscopes to see them. The term microbe is very general. It, it use, it's used to, to talk about all kinds of different life forms. And these really vary dramatically in size and shape and characteristics. They include things like bacteria, fungi, viruses, microscopic plants and animals, and even the very ancient archaea. So, uh, Bacteria, viruses, and parasites are the main culprits when it comes to foodborne diseases, so we're gonna focus on those. But microbes in general are everywhere, including on us and in us. If you were able to gather all the microbes on and in your body, it would weigh about three pounds. That's the size of your brain. Now don't, don't freak out, <laughs> it's okay, because most of them are actually helping us. At the very least, they're really not doing anything than just hanging out. But they can help us with different functions like digestion, protection, and excretion. They also help to keep the quote-unquote bad microbes away by basically outcrowding them. They just take up all the space that the bad ones would take. So what is the difference between bacteria and viruses and parasites? You know, what are the different microbes? Now I threw in toxins and other agents because they aren't living, but they are often products or associated with some of these other microbes. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little while. So let's start with the bacteria. Bacteria is a very simple creature. They're found everywhere in all sorts of environments. Your tabletops, they're in the soil, 
They're in our digestive tract. They're in animals. They can be found in the extremes, the Antarctic. They can also be found in hot water vents in the ocean, which are boiling. And there's some very vague evidence that maybe they're even extraterrestrial. Who knows? But they are single cells and they have very simple internal organs. So here you can see some of the internal organelles. And these have different functions, just like the organs in our body. But of course, they're very tiny and they're, uh, they're smaller, of course, than the single cell. So here's, um, you can see that the bacteria come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, I will tell you, these are all actually micrographs taken through a microscope of different types of bacteria. They aren't really these colors. Um, they're colorized, like, you know, the Vibrio is not purple. They're colorized to help us see them better. So you see that they come in different shapes and sizes. They're very diverse. Most bacteria are smaller than our cells, but there are some that are pretty big. Um, and bacteria are the direct descendants of the first organisms that lived on Earth. There's actually fossil evidence for bacteria that goes back 3.5 billion years. Pretty phenomenal. Now, it's true that some bacteria do cause human diseases, but there are others that are important to us. They're a vital role in some of the functions of our body, like digestion, uh, like immu immunity. Those that live on our skin help with that. Um, those in the digestive system can do nutrient metabolism. They can help with vitamin production. They, of course, help with waste processing. So they actually can be uh, quite helpful to us and even necessary in, in some cases. Our next type of microbe is a virus. And a virus, just like our bacteria, come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. But different than the bacteria, these are much simpler creatures. Uh, they are usually just made up of a few substances. Uh, nucleic acids, which are going to be their genetic material. They also will have proteins. And sometimes they have lipids, which are fats. The thing with viruses is they cannot reproduce on their own. They have to infect a cell. And what they do is they take over that cell's machinery, the organelles and everything, and they have that cell produce more viruses. That's how they reproduce. Viruses are also very specialized. So they are going to infect only certain types of hosts, only certain types of cell within that host. So an example would be uh, this bacteriophage we see here, which is only going to infect bacteria. It won't go after human cells. For On the human side of it, think of HIV, which infects only certain types of immune cells in primates. So here's a kind of a blow-up cartoon of... Uh, of the virus and what it looks like. This is, you know, a very simplified uh, kind of general picture of it. So you have the nucleic acid in the middle. It can be DNA or it can be RNA. And then there is a protein coat that surrounds it. And then these kind of projections sticking out, these spikes that are sticking out, or act like Velcro to attach onto a cell and infect it. Our next group are parasites. And parasites are uh, often multicellular, but still microscopic organisms. And they can be found in food. Uh, and the most common ones in the U.S. are protozoa and worms, helminths or worms, right? So um, they can be transmitted by water. Um, sometimes they're in the soil and the person can pick them up that way. Um, they can also be transmitted person to person. So, for example, uh, one of the protozoa would be this toxoplasmosis that we see up here in the left corner. So this is a cartoon of it. 
And then this is an actual micrograph of the toxoplasmosis cells. So there's a couple of them there. Uh, another type of parasite that can cause foodborne illnesses are the helminths, the worms. So here we have uh, a tapeworm. And then below it is the trichinella. Uh, and trichinella used to be associated with undercooked pork, but that's pretty much, that's pretty rare anymore. And then another type of parasite would be this sci-fi looking giardia. And giardia is often found in contaminated water. So several years ago now, the city of Scranton, Pennsylvania actually had giardia in the city water supply. And you could imagine that that caused quite a bit of problems. Now our fourth category aren't really living critters. Um, they're actually kind of byproducts of, of different kinds of uh, microbes. So toxins is one. And um, I will say that most food poisoning is actually caused by bacteria, viruses, or parasites. But these kinds of toxins, like natural toxins, uh, think of things like the mold on food or uh, poisonous mushrooms, or the puffer fish, that would be a natural toxin. Some bacteria produce natural, nat natural toxins. Then there's also chemical toxins like pesticides. Uh, so they can, these can, but they're not as common as our bacteria, viruses, and, and parasites. To, not as common to cause foodborne illnesses. There's also this um, really unusual thing uh, prion, and there's controversy whether it's alive or not. But what a prion is, it's actually a protein that does not fold correctly. So when a protein is produced by a cell, it naturally folds in a certain conformation. So this, so here would be an example of it, right? Um, not a problem. But sometimes something goes wrong. There may be some something goes wrong uh, and that it doesn't fold correctly and it has the potential to become a prion and this would be an infective agent. So think mad cow disease. That's probably the most common prion caused disease that people know of primarily in, in cows, of course um, in humans, the prion disease is the neurogenerative neurogenerative disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Very rare, but devastating. So now let's talk about actual foodborne illnesses or food poisoning. We talked about the basic biology of what causes these foodborne illnesses. Now we're going to get specific and talk about the actual uh uh, critters that cause it and also how to prevent it or avoid it. So what causes foodborne illnesses? Well, there's a huge suspect list and this is not even complete. But what you would see if you looked at it closely is a lot of bacteria, viruses, parasites, some toxins. According to the CDC, researchers have identified over 250 foodborne illnesses. Now, most of them are bacteria, viruses, and parasites. So um, I also wanted to let you guys know that, that there are some common food myths, uh, myths about food safety. And so my question is, are they really myths or not? Well, we'll find out as we go through. So the reason I, I put this list here is because as we're talking about the different causative agents for foodborne illnesses, I want you to think about these myths. So once something is cooked, it kills the bacteria, no problem. And related to that, if you freeze or refrigerate something, it's going to kill the bacteria and you're not going to have to worry about that either. So here's another one. If you're a vegan or a vegetarian, man, you're in the clear. You don't have to worry about foodborne illnesses at all. Uh, and we know that we should wash our fruits and vegetables, but we should also wash our meat to get rid of the bacteria on them before we cook them. And if something has a peel, and not just that you like it, but actual peel on it, you don't have to worry about the bacteria on it because you're not eating that part. 
And then when in doubt, smell the food, you know, give it the old sniff test. And that'll tell you if it's contaminated or not. So keep these in mind as we go through. And I think we'll answer all of these. So we're going to start with a survey. Of course, I can't really give you the survey. So I'll just give you a few seconds to think about what you would answer. Which is the leading cause of foodborne illness in the U.S.? Now, I would guess that most people would pick salmonella or E. coli because they are the most uh, publicized, perhaps. But the actual answer is neurovirus. Yes, neurovirus. Um, and we'll talk about that in detail in the next few slides. Really, all of these microbes can be present on your food when you purchase it or when you eat it. And that contamination by these microbes can occur anywhere along the route from the field to the dinner plate. So, you know, those farm to table kinds of ideas can refer to more than just uh, where your food is coming from and where it's going. So according to the CDC, these are the five most common causes of foodborne illness in the USA. Uh, neurovirus being number one, we just talked about that. And then Salmonella, Clostridium perfringens, Campylobacter, and Staphylococcus aureus. And we're going to talk about them in detail, but before we get into it, I wanted to mention these four. And all four of these are bacteria. These are dishonorable mention because they are the ones that most often lead to hospitalization. Uh, and I wanted to point out Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism. This one in particular, keep in mind that um, kids or babies who are under the age of one, they have a special risk when they eat honey because it can cause a special top type of botulism in those kids. So kids under one should not be eating any kind of honey, raw honey or any honey. So, you know, again, just kind of tuck those away as uh, something you want to avoid. But, um, and anything we talk about as far as prevention in the next several slides would apply to, to these pretty much. So let's actually talk about our top five. The neurovirus is, of course, a virus. It is not related to influenza, uh, and it is the second most common virus after the common cold that will cause a disease. Um, so about 23 million cases of gastroenteritis per year is caused by neurovirus. Most of those are healthcare facility related, about two thirds. So if you're not in a healthcare facility, you're still not in the clear because 22% of them are actually related to restaurants. So it takes the neurovirus 12 to 48 hours of incubation before you start to see symptoms. And those symptoms are then going to last about one to three days. So what are the symptoms? Well, uh, the gastroenteritis of neurovirus causes uh, nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, possibly a headache, possibly a low-grade fever. Uh, this disease, sometimes called viral gastroenteritis or winter diarrhea, um, the diarrhea is more common in adults. And it's watery, but not bloody. For kids, what you see mostly when they get neurovirus is vomiting. And that vomiting is explosive and projectile, and it's often the first symptom that you see with the kids. So these symptoms are pretty much what you're going to see with all foodborne illnesses, but there are some slight differences. So here's a cartoon of the neurovirus, and here is actually an electron micrograph of the neurovirus, or viruses in this case. So how do we end up getting it? Well, it is scientifically called the oral fecal route for infection, and it is exactly what it sounds like, as gross as it sounds. Uh, some sort of fecal matter contaminates something. Uh, it could be our food, it could be our water, it could be our hands, and it ends up in our mouth, and we eat it, and we end up with um, the infection. 
So it could be direct contact with an infected person or a contaminated surface. Again, now it's going to somehow get into your mouth. Uh, raw produce. Uh, this is one of the big ones for uh, neurovirus. And contaminated drinking water is a possibility. Uncooked food and shellfish from contaminated water, especially oysters. So this is a kind of thing you might see in the newspaper every once in a while where a cruise ship, you know, the people on it end up with a neurovirus infection uh, and you can imagine that they're miserable, but it's kind of a microcosm where, you know, they're, they're, they're all stuck together and they're sharing uh, tables and, uh, you know, if, if, yeah, it just, you know, it just ends up just kind of going from person to person to person, especially if we're not using preventative measures. So how do you prevent it? Wash your hands. Okay. And you want to use soap and water with neurovirus. Those alcohol rubs do not work with neurovirus. Um, you also want to clean your fruits and veggies prior to eating them. And the best way to do that is to wash them under running water. Uh, make sure that you're thoroughly cooking your shellfish. If kids are sick, keep them out of the food area. Actually, anybody, you want to keep them out of the food area. The problem with neurovirus is that the virus is actually in your bowel movement before you start to feel sick. And it will actually stay there for up to two weeks after you feel better. So you really want to continue washing your hands often uh, during this time, whether it's you or someone else uh, who's, who has neurovirus. Then you want to clean and disinfect food prep surfaces. And when we talk about disinfection, you know, it doesn't have to be anything complex. Bleach is the best disinfectant for viruses and bacteria. And it doesn't, you know, you, you don't want to use straight bleach. You dilute it. Um, usually somewhere between... Uh, five tablespoons to 25 tablespoons per gallon of water. And of course, if anything gets soiled, you want to clean it. So here's our cartoon where this guy has neurovirus. He just vomited. He wiped his mouth, didn't wash his hands, and now he's shaking hands with somebody else. And if this guy doesn't wash his hands, um, and he's maybe a fingernail chewer, um, he's going to end up with that virus. So definitely washing your hands is very important. So here's another survey. Uh, which food is the most common cause of food poisoning outbreaks? So, you know, if you're guessing something, I'll just point out that at the end of last year, the clue is that there was a recall of certain types of lettuce. And that exactly is what the number one cause of food poisoning outbreaks are. So they did this big study that looked at a number of years, 1973 to 2012, and they found that about 85% of food poisoning outbreaks in the U.S. were caused by leafy greens. So we're talking about cabbage, kale, lettuce, spinach, right? And by the way, it's usually neurovirus that's causing that. So if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you know, you still have that risk of uh, food food poisoning. You know, some people might have chose eggs as this, and eggs are indeed most implicated in salmonella, uh, foodborne illness. So let's talk salmonella a little bit. Salmonella is a bacteria. Remember, we talked about neurovirus, which is a virus. So salmonella bacteria was actually discovered in the US by guess who? Dr. Salmon, hence Salmonella. And it's actually been known to cause foodborne illnesses for about 125 years. So there are actually two different kinds of Salmonella illnesses, foodborne illnesses. One is the gastrointestinal illness. So the nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, fever, all those symptoms, they occur about six to 48 hours after you've been infected, and then they're going to last up to a week. Uh, the second type is more rare, but it's 
much more severe. It's typhoid-like. So we're talking about high fever. Uh, you may have diarrhea or it may go the other way and you have constipation. You're going to be achy, have a headache, uh, be tired and lethargic, um, and you may end up with a rash. Now, the typhoid type is linked to human feces. So um, human sewage may contaminate drinking water or it may contaminate crops because uh, they were irrigated with sewage containing water and that's where you'd end up with the typhoid like salmonella. There are complications for both of these that can occur. Reactive arthritis occurs mainly with the gastrointestinal illness and it happens in about anywhere between 2 and 15 percent of people who end up with salmonella illness. Um, the symptoms are arthritis, inflammation of the joints, and they usually appear about 18 days after you've had that GI, uh, the GI symptoms. So if you think, well, if I get salmonella, I'll take antibiotics and that'll prevent all this, you know, possible con uh, complications. Uh, no, actually the antibiotics don't don't help at all with, with that. You would still get that reactive arthritis. This um, reactive arthritis can last for months or years, and it can even lead to chronic arthritis. The other one, focal infection, is most associated with the typhoid-like salmonella. And what ends up happening is the salmonella bacteria take root in a body tissue, and it causes an illness uh, an inflammation of some sort. So maybe it will get in the sac around your heart and it will cause endocarditis. So how do we end up getting it? Well, it is also that fecal oral route of transmission. So, uh, you know, it can be, we, we talked about the human uh, with the typhoid, but it can also be animal feces. It's mostly associated with eggs. Um, but also other kinds of meats, including poultry, uh, fruits and vegetables can also be contaminated. It can also be found in processed foods and dry foods. And you can also get it from pets, especially reptiles and chickens. And, and our chicken is really embarrassed that she could possibly give you salmonella. Um, here is a very pretty colorized picture of an actual salmonella bacteria. Salmonella is most commonly found in summer, but that doesn't mean that's the only time you can get it. So how do you prevent salmonella? Well, the CDC came up with this four-pronged approach to prevent salmonella. Uh, so clean is the first one. So washing your hands. Uh, and in this case, you can use those uh, alcohol-based rubs. Washing your utensils, your cutting boards, your countertops with hot soapy water, before and after you use them. You do not want to wash the meat though, because if you're washing the meat, it'll, you know, the spray from the water will carry the bacteria and contaminate things around the sink. So you do not ever want to wash uh, your raw meats. And of course, sanitize. So we talked about sanitizing using that dilute uh, bleach solution. You want to separate things. So keep your raw meat your poultry, your seafood, your eggs separate from uh, fruits and vegetables and other kinds of foods. Not just in your prep area, but also in your refrigerator and in your grocery cart even. And we'll talk about that a little later. Um, and then also you want to use two different cutting boards. This is really important. You don't want to cut meat on, on a cutting board and then cut your bread up on that same cutting board. You want to use two separate cutting boards for it, even if you wash it in between. You also want to uh, cook things to the correct internal temperature. And you can find that information at this website, the, at, at cdc.gov. And you also want to chill things. So after you've cooked them, you want to make sure that you, within two hours, uh, within two hours, you want to get your food in the refrigerator after cooking it. And make sure that your refrigerator is at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or cooler. So here's, here's another survey question. Which cutting board is the safest when it comes to food safety? So this one, I will tell you that people uh, struggle with. And 
it's not unusual because the answer to it is not cut and dry. And that, that was a pun, by the way, cut and dry. Uh, anyway, years ago, the government said don't use wooden cutting boards because they can get infected. They're harder to keep clean than plastic ones. But there's been a lot of research since then that says that it really doesn't matter which kind of cutting board you use as long as you follow some really simple rules. One, make sure you have that separate cutting board for your meats and then another cutting board for your bread, fruits, and vegetables. Then the other thing you want to do is make sure that you wash your cutting board with hot soapy water. Now, of course, the plastic ones you can put in the dishwasher. And then the other thing you want to do is periodically you want to sanitize your cutting board. So with a very dilute bleach solution, one tablespoon in a gallon of water. And then rinse it really well. And then let it dry so that the bacteria has no water because it needs water to grow. And then the other thing you want to do is eventually after you've cut on it and you have a lot of grooves and, and things in your cutting board, you want to make sure that you uh, get rid of it and get a new one. So the next bacteria we're going to talk about is Clostridium perfringens. And here you can see them kind of swimming around. Um, Clostridium is, is different. Um, first of all, there are non-pathogenic, so non-disease causing Clostridium perfringens. And they're everywhere in the environment. They're found uh, everywhere in the environment, including in our intestines and the intestines of animals. But there is a pathogenic species that, that produces a toxin, and that's what's going to cause us to get sick from Clostridium perfringens. It's also known as the food service germ, and we'll, I'll explain why it's called that in the next few slides. So Clostridium is, again, it's kind of unique. It's known as an anaerobe. It prefers to grow with little or no oxygen. So anaerobe without air, right? Anaerobe, no oxygen or little oxygen. I already told you about the toxin, but it also, um, if it's in a hostile environment, an environment that it doesn't like, it'll start to produce these spores. And these spores are actually um, this kind of, hard encased uh, material that keeps all the stuff that it needs to regrow inside. So here's a cartoon of the Clostridium perfringens forming a spore. And then this is an actual um, micrograph of it. So you can see at the very end there are these round things and those are going to be spores. They're, they're spores that are starting to form. Now Clostridium is pretty quick growing. Uh, so, oh, I wanted to tell you too that if you eat the bacteria that produces the toxin, you'll get sick. But also if you eat the spores, so if you, you know, the bacteria is there and you, you start to, to heat it up and you're not heating it enough, it'll form these spores and then you eat those and they'll start growing in your intestines. And they grow very quickly, 6 to 16 hours before you see symptoms. But it does pass very quickly also, 24 hours. So with Clostridium perfringens, you get intense abdominal cramps. You also get watery diarrhea. And you will also get... Um, nausea. So you don't usually get fever or vomiting with, with this bacteria. So what are the, the main carriers or causes of it? Mostly undercooked meats and often large quantities of food that's prepared for a large group of people and it sits out for a long period of time. That's why it's called the food service bug or germ. Because you can imagine you go to the, uh, you know, the buffet and they're not keeping the temperature correct. So I'm not condemning all buffets, but the temperature is not right. It's below 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And now sitting at the bottom of that stew or the casserole or the gravy are these bacteria where they're not getting a lot of oxygen and they're growing like crazy. Um, so, so that's where... Um, where it's called that food service germ. 
Oh, so how do you prevent it? Well, you want to cook thoroughly, especially your meats, and then keep them hot above 140 degrees. And you want to serve them pretty quickly and keep them at that hot temperature. And then when you're done with them, you want to get them in the refrigerator within a couple of hours. Uh, so if you've had that meat tray sitting out all day, you know, you had the people over for an open house or whatever, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, get rid of it. Throw it out. Uh, it's not worth that risk. And uh, it can get on produce, though it's not as common on produce. So again, just washing it under clean running water can help get rid of all those bacteria or, or most of them anyway. So our next bacteria is Campylobacter, and it's a kind of cool looking, it's called a spirochete. It's, it's a, you know, spiral shape and it has this little tail. So this is a cartoon of it, and then this is actual electron micrograph of the spirochete. Uh, Campylobacter is also fecal oral root. Um, chickens, cows, and other animals that we eat have it in their intestines, in their liver, in their giblets. And so when they go to get processed to slaughter, it can then end up spreading onto the meat. So in um, 2014, the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System tested raw chicken from retailers and found that 33% of them were contaminated with Campylobacter. Now I'll tell you, because of this study or this this yeah, this study, uh, it's gotten better. So it's not as bad. But still, you don't want to, you know, you don't certainly don't want to eat raw chicken, but you want to be careful about uh, it cross-contaminating other things. So it takes about two to five days to incubate, and then it lasts about a week. So with Campylobacter, you end up with those typical um, symptoms the difference is that the diarrhea may be bloody with this, with this illness. So there are complications that can occur with Campylobacter, and, and this is one of the issues. So if somebody is immunocompromised, maybe they're having chemotherapy or uh, they have AIDS, they have a weak immune system, and this bacteria can get into the bloodstream, and it can cause a life-threatening uh, sepsis infection. The other complication is Guillain-Barr syndrome and about one in a thousand people who have had a couple Campylobacter infections, so yeah, it's more than one Campylobacter infection, will get um, or could get Guillain-Barr syndrome. And what this is, is you get one infection, then maybe you get a second one, and it triggers something in the immune system, and it causes muscle weakness and paralysis. It'll start in the legs as tingling, muscle weakness. It'll go up the legs, it'll go up the arms, and it'll uh, finally end up in the trunk area. Uh, it can lead to paralysis, and that paralysis uh, can can last for weeks to several years. And of course it's gonna be, you know, a lot of medical care. And pe most people recover from this fully, but it may take a very long time to completely recover from it. And um, it's more common in men and people who are over 50. So how do you end up getting Campylobacter? Well, raw or undercooked poultry is the main main thing or something that touched it. So here's our picture where you're going to, you know, be fancy and you're going to grill your watermelon along with your chicken. And before you get it out there to the grill, somebody grabs that watermelon and starts eating it. Well, it was rubbed up against this raw chicken. And so, you know, you start to worry about whether or not they're going to get Campylobacter. Things like uh, raw unpasteurized milk and, and dairy products, um, water contaminated with animal feces, uh, crops contaminated with animal feces can all be, uh, cause, cause Campylobacter. Most cases in summer, just like Salmonella, uh, remember norovirus is winter. Also, uh, about one in five of Campylobacter infections 
are associated with traveling abroad, international travel, especially in uh, develop in the developing world. So know if you're traveling, know where your water's coming from. So how do you prevent it? Wash your hands. Um, really keep the raw poultry and raw meat separate from other foods while preparing it. Cook the poultry completely. You know, please, no medium rare chicken. Uh, drink your pasteurized milk. I know raw milk sometimes is popular, but just be aware that you are taking a risk if you're doing it. And again, know where your water comes from, especially if you're traveling abroad. I love this picture because this dog is waiting for that T-bone to drop on the floor and it's his. So our next bacteria is Staphylococcus aureus. And uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of a whole bunch of Staphylococcus aureus. Um, Staph aureus is uh, ubiquitous. It's everywhere, and it's almost impossible to get rid of it. It can be found in the dust in the air, in sewage, in milk, in water, uh, in food, on food equipment, in the environment, on environmental surfaces, on humans, in humans, on and in animals. Um, Staph aureus also is very versatile when it comes to causing different kinds of diseases. It, it of course can cause food poisoning, but it also is the cause of toxic shock syndrome. It can cause a type of pneumonia. It can cause post-operative wound infections. It can also cause a uh, bacteremia that's usually associated with hospitals. And the other thing is, um, they are everywhere, but the other thing is MRSA. So MRSA is a Staph aureus. It's methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Uh, so the, the gastrointestinal symptoms uh, are very similar to what we see with all the rest of our our uh, microbes, nausea and vomiting, abdominal cramps and diarrhea. You're going to, it's very fast. Within seven hours after infection, you're going to get it. And it's going to last, it's pretty short lived. So it's often um, misdiagnosed or, you know, you go, well, I have the 24 hour flu. And so you don't really, um, you don't, you don't actually realize that you have Staph aureus. The other thing with Staph aureus, it also is caused by, the, the illness is caused by a toxin, and the bacteria itself is pretty heat stable, so it takes a lot to kill it. And then um, it doesn't form spores, but it does take a lot to destroy it, and the toxin is very heat stable, so you can't destroy it by, you know, by boiling something or, or heating it up a, a lot. So how do you end up getting it? Usually it's things that um, you don't cook after you prepare them. So we're talking about like your tuna egg salad, chicken salad, right? Sandwiches at the deli, pastries. So these are things that are made uh, and handled perhaps several times. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that staff, staphylococcus is found on the skin and nasal passages of, of most of us especially people in healthcare, by the way. So if somebody's making you a sandwich, they're not wearing gloves, maybe they're sniffling a little bit, um, and then they hand it off to somebody else who's not wearing gloves, uh, you know, your risk goes up and up. It is not person to person. Uh, it has to be, you know, on onto your food or water. So how do you prevent it? Well, wash your hands and hopefully your food preparers are washing their hands. If you are serving or you're being served, you know, make sure there are gloves involved. <laughs> and of course, keeping food at a, a good temperature. So cold, less than 40 degrees or hot above 140 degrees. Cook thoroughly and then get it in the fridge, you know, when you're not using it. Using that clean, separate, cook and chill. Uh, that four-pronged approach is really, really good. So I have a little video for you guys. Oops, here's our video. And this is going to talk about what are the steps in, you know, what happens when you get food poisoning. That's probably still good, right? Oh, 
Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Oh, uh, there we go. That's probably still good, right? Oh. Sorry about that, guys. I'm having a little technical difficulties. Let's start it again. Yeah, so this guy really didn't learn his lesson. Uh, he he was going to, you know, try it again. So let, let's us learn our lesson and let's talk a little food safety. You know, when you think about it, in the U.S., we really do have one of the safest and most reliable food systems in the world. Um, of course, there are going to be exceptions to it. And we see that, you know, in the recalls and the newspaper article uh, uh, articles that we see. But most of us feed, uh, trust our food system, but, you know, it's always good to be aware and be proactive. So let's talk about, you know, how we do that. So we're going to start with another survey and what is the best way to prevent foodborne illnesses? And this is really a way for me to test to see whether you're paying attention or not. And so I am hoping that you all have chosen to wash your hands often. Um, you know, I wish stop eating were an option, but uh, definitely not. So yes, wash your hands. Uh, I am not going to read all the different times you should wash your hands, but you know, often uh, is really the best way to do it. And anytime you're touching anything that could be potentially contaminated, uh, you definitely want to wash your hands. So the next question, of course, is, how do you wash your hands correctly? And so this young man is going to teach us how to wash our hands correctly. Do you know how to wash your hands? First, wet your hands. Then get some soap. Rub your hands together to make a lather. Make sure you get in between your fingers and up onto your wrist. Rub your hands together for at least 20 seconds. It's just like seeing the ABCs, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, N, L, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, N, Z. Now I know my ABCs, next time won't you sing with me. Now let's rinse all the suds and the germs down the sink. Then, dry your hands. 
and now you have clean hands. Okay. So it's just that simple. So besides the ABCs, you can actually um, sing happy birthday twice, too. So another thing to, in order to be aware of food safety is to know which foods are most likely to cause a foodborne illness. So we've talked about these, um, you know, depending on what the microbe was, but really raw or undercooked meat, raw eggs, raw seafood, uh, sprouts, not washing your fruits and veggies, not uh, having pasteurized milk or milk products, and that honey uh, for kids less than one year old, which can cause uh, botulism. Uh, so somebody asked during the webinar, the live webinar, about sushi and rare meat. Yeah, so honestly, I love sushi, and I also like my steaks rare. So I think you know, you want to use some wisdom and some common sense, right? You want to go to a restaurant. First of all, you, you want to know that you're at risk when you eat this stuff and you have to be okay with that. And then the other thing is go to restaurants that you know are safe. So look at their safety records, look at comments online. You know, certainly if you see things like, you know, I ate at this sushi place and I was sick as a dog for the next three days, you don't want to go there, right? <laughs> But, uh, and the same thing with a steak place, you know, you just kind of want to be aware and be proactive and then realize that you are going to, you know, life is full of risks. You're going to accept that risk. Uh, also, you want to keep in mind that you want to think food safety when you go into the grocery store. Probably we don't think about that. And also when you go to a restaurant. But we're not the only ones that are being proactive. The Food and Drug Administration is uh, monitoring things, but also there's more than 3,000 state, local, and tribal agencies that regulate retail food, food service, um, you know, everything from restaurants and grocery stores to vending machines and institutional cafes and things like that are all going to be monitored. But keep in mind that this is inspection and oversight, so it's not 100%. Um, and, but they are using science-based food safety. And so, um, you know, there's all these new research coming out, so it's something uh, that they're keeping up with as well. So for us, you know, taking some responsibility for our own food safety, in the grocery store, like I said, most people don't think about the grocery store, but, you know, we get food from all over the world, uh, and everything we're getting has multiple risks associated with it because, you know, everywhere from the farm to the producer to us as consumers, there is a, a chance for uh, contamination. So making sure that the store you're, you're shopping in is clean, Right. You also want to shop in the order of least to most likely to be contaminated. So your non-perishables would be first. Canned goods, you know, box goods. Cold foods would be next in your cart. Um, deli items. And then last, the fruit and veggies on top. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I never thought about shopping in this order before. You also want to look at what you're buying. Does the produce look good? You know, is the packaging good? Is your meat juices all over the outside of the packaging? Um, and then also the color and smell. Now, we saw in the video that smell doesn't always do it. But if it doesn't smell right, then chances are it is contaminated. It doesn't work the other way. If it smells okay, it still may have contamination on it. But certainly, if it smells rotten, it is. And then uh, temperature. So you're probably not carrying a thermometer around with you. But, um, you know, does it feel like it's cold? Does it feel like it's a refrigerated uh, item when it's supposed to be refrigerated? Also, they often provide hand sanitizers and wipes in the grocery store. Use them. Take your groceries home and get them in the fridge. If you're going to do some errands, then take a cooler along. Uh, if it's hot, don't put the food in the trunk. Put it in your in air conditioned car. When you get it home, you know, again, put it in the refrigerator or freezer as soon as you can. 
And then if you're using those um, reusable grocery bags, it's a good thing, but think about washing and sanitizing them also. Um, another thing too is to think about restaurants. So every year, you know, people get foodborne illnesses. It's estimated that about half of those come from restaurants or delis. Uh, so, you know, check the inspection scores. Um, make sure the restaurant is clean. You know, I have a chef friend who says if he can't see the kitchen, he doesn't eat there. And it's not bad advice, you know, to be able to see that the kitchen is clean. Um, also make sure your food is cooked thoroughly. And if you send it back to get it, you know, cooked more, Tell them you want a new plate because you could actually have contamination from those raw juices on the plate. And if they don't change it, it doesn't matter how much they cook it. You could still end up with that contamination. Then if you're taking home the doggy bag, um, make sure you refrigerate that as soon as possible. And then if the you know employees, your, your uh, wait staff or your uh, cooks are sick, uh, I would probably not eat there. And then, of course, you know, we all want to eat healthy, but start thinking about food safety as part of eating healthy. So, yeah, wash. Wash your hands, wash the surfaces, wash the utensils, and sanitize. So, again, that dilute bleach uh, solution. Separate your foods, not just when you're shopping, but in your refrigerator and also when you're preparing. Remember those two different uh, cutting boards. And then, of course, cook it to the right temperature and um, store it. Keep it, you know, if you're going to keep it hot for a while, make sure it's at the right temperature above 140 and then store it uh, below 40. So here's our danger zone where the bacteria are going to grow uh, really well. So above 140 to heat it and below 40 degrees Fahrenheit in your refrigerator. So here's our last survey. Which of the following is true? Rinsing my hands briefly before working with food is enough. Once food's been cooked, all the bacteria are killed. Don't have to worry. It's okay to thaw meat on the counter because it was frozen and the bacteria have been killed by the freezing process. And then using different utensils, equipment, and cutting boards to work with different foods is safe. So of course that is the true one. So um, keep in mind also that who is most vulnerable to foodborne illnesses, and that would be the very young, the very old, pregnant women, and people who have problems with their immune system. This is true for uh, any of the foodborne illnesses that we talked about today. And then we also talked these common myths, and I will tell you that every one of them, I think we covered them all, but every one of these are indeed myths. Um, I think we may not have talked about the peeling, uh, but yeah, once you, you know, if you, if it has a peel and you cut through it, it's possible to drag that contamination through, um, through the food. So in summary, any food can be infected with disease causing agents at any place along the processing route. The good thing is these are usually short duration illnesses, but they are not pleasant. Um, the very young, the very old, anybody who's pregnant or a weak immune system are more vulnerable to a more severe illness and also to complications. Know where the risk is. What kind of foods are highest risk? What kinds of practices give, give you a higher risk? Uh, and also keep in mind that most food poisonings, or about half, are associated with restaurants. So really be proactive in choosing what kind of restaurant you go to. So I thank you very much for listening to this webinar. If you have any questions, uh, you are please, you can email me. Uh, here's my email down here, and I will try my best to answer them. I hope you have a great day, and uh, thanks again.